this business, I mean, you should, for me, it's a passion. It had nothing to do about making money or all those other things that people, I've never owned a boat, I've never owned a farm or light aircraft. Around. To me, it was about building a business into what I call a passion for the product. And when you look at what's happened in my lifetime, um, sadly, it's been the rise and fall of the Australian motor industry. And I think that's the sad part to be witnessing it. And the reason I sold Holden in uh, 2002, I think it was, because I got terrified of what was happening in Detroit with the parent company. We didn't even have a refrigerator, we had an ice chest. And yet, uh, American homes were equipped with everything that you could think about. It was absolutely unbelievable to go through this Holden plant and see these presses and everything at work. And it was a whole Sunday spent in, like to me, was a fantasy world. <laughs> I decided on that I wanted to go in the motor industry. And in 1956, I bought a business at Seacliff called Seacliff Motors. And that was principally a service station with a big service. I had four mechanics and I started buying and selling cars. And I met up with Max Smith from Smith Motor Company. Anyhow, I went there principally to what I wanted to do was to learn how did a Holden dealership function. We had this little showroom with, I think, five cars and that was it. And um, anyhow, uh, I decided, and I don't know for what reason why, but in those days, there were more people wanting the car than we had. Now, I built a house when I got married on Henley Beach Road at Fulham in 58, and I bought it off a Bulgarian market garden of the land. And that led me to meeting pretty near every Bulgarian market gardener from Henley Beach Road to Grange Road. And it was like taking lollies from a child to sell people cars. And one would be related to the other and it just dominated. And I thought, what the heck is this business all about? Anyhow, to cut a long story short, um, I built a relationship with them. You'd have to go there at night after they'd had dinner uh, and generally all the family would be around the table and there'd be home brew on the table and that was it. And um, they, for some reason, wanted cars. But funnily, they all spoke Bulgarian. Very few of them spoke English. And you generally talk through an interpreter. And this led to um, building a business that just grew like Topsy. And there was no idea of going to these training schools that Holden were having in Melbourne because the business didn't work that way at Port Adelaide. <laughs> We'd grown the volume of Smith Motor Company to where the volume was bigger than City Motors. We were doing about 130 cars a month. And I couldn't understand this reason why people were talking about all the systems you had to go through to sell product because the demand for Holden was there. To have a launch of a new model Holden product was an unbelievable affair. And uh, I'll never forget when the EJ Holden came out in 63. We built a stage, we released the car the same as what uh, they did it through Holden. And anyhow, uh, we then had a books around 
who people who'd like to have a, a demonstration drive, would they put their name and address in it? And we finished up with over a thousand names of people. And I, I couldn't understand why more dealers weren't doing it. It didn't make sense to me to be buying full pages in the advertiser when there was a starvation of product that these people wanted to buy. And they were genuine. And that's what I did. And um, against all odds, I, I mean, my company secretary, Kim Adams, said to me, he said, you'll never do it. And he was a chartered accountant from KPMG. And he said, you'll never do it because he said the economy's too bad. I read this on the Stock Exchange and um, I uh, kept it there until I decided that the problems with General Motors were getting too big and that's when I cleaned the shareholders out. I didn't want them to get hurt and then I sold it to a private purchaser. But, but I wasn't going to let the public listed shareholders get caught in what I could see a downdraft of profitability coming from General Motors. Now, I was a little bit early, but it happened in 2009, bankruptcy. But if I go back, I'll, I'll explain to you what happened in the 70s, because that's where the history lies. Yes. Um, after the Hubert Harvey's death, I was still running the business and growing it, and I believed that we could, my parts business was the key to it, and I wanted to grow parts because parts was a profitability that was there all the time didn't have the vagaries of the market. So um, I concentrated on the fixed operations and we built United Motors into a driven by parts and then I bought the property in Franklin Street opposite the showroom of Mans Motors, an old company, and um, it, we put in there an expanded parts operation because where we were in Perry Street was too small. And uh, I did that in the uh, mid 70s. And we had what I call the nuclear scene to grow again. And by chance, uh, I had the Rolls Royce franchise. Out of that came what I call an instant growth of United Motors because it effectively doubled the business because they had a much bigger parts business. And I've said I've been involved with Holden since 1958 and this is now 1986. I said, where the heck is it? Anyhow, um, <coughs> whatever the cause was, um, I had to wear it and uh, they didn't renew Adelaide when it came up for renewal in December 88 and uh, so I said well too bad so you've got to move on and realise that's what you do but fortunately um, they did that and then less than a year later BMW knocked on the door all they wanted was a dealership to be built for BMW and have everything on the one side. Sales, parts, service, pre-owned cars, everything had to be on the one side. And that was the condition. And um, they thought I should get, have a look out in um, probably Polk Street or Unley Road to attract the eastern suburbs. And I said, well, Good idea, but I said, <coughs> how do you know 
the people in the western suburbs are not going to buy your product. I said, you've got to look at BMW appealing to every part of Adelaide and every part of the state. And uh, I said, I think it should go on a premium side because it's a premium product and uh, that's what led us to West Terrace. And um, I've never regretted coming here. That was 89 and 1990, in June 1990, they asked me to do Tasmania. They didn't have a deal with it. So I did that and um, I eventually built them a standalone dealership. There was no sitting down writing a, a blueprint. Uh, I didn't have time to do that. Uh, it, it was all about opportunity. And opportunity comes to those who seek it. But the Holden dealer team, to me, again was done because of passion. I believe Peter Brock was the focal point of our image in Australia because he was a brilliant driver but put a microphone under him and he was a very good public representative for Holden. And when John Rock, the director of sales, I was at the Australian dealers meeting at the Fisherman's Bend Centre for Holden, the head office, and I think it was the early December 79, and John Rock spoke to me and said, I want you to take over the Holden dealer team. Um, we've got to be out of motorsport. Uh, that's an instruction from Detroit. And I think you've got the energy, you've got the resources to put it all together and um, we must get it out of the buildings that are in behind the Fisherman's Bend head office. They're old buildings that were part of the history of Holden. And um, anyhow, he gave me until the end of January to get everything out and virtually put it together. So I had a meeting with Peter Brock and I said to him, well, you're the principal of racing. Um, you form a company and uh, we'll find premises, which I did, uh, and um, at North Melbourne we set it up. Then came the question of fitting it out and uh, the, um, I couldn't get GMAC to fund the fit out. It was about $50,000 and so um, I went to a sander and they agreed to do it if I guaranteed it, which I did. And uh, Peter got set up there and um, Bruce Nowacki who was his head technician, who was a brilliant man, and they uh, got all the equipment they needed and they had the race cars there. The problem was the race cars then were A9X Tiranas and they had been out of production for a long while and we had to get the Commodore homologated for racing. So I finished up, found myself suddenly involved with CAMS and I went to two meetings with Peter and um, we uh, were told we had to build 500 cars and sell them. Uh, they had doubts that Holden had pulled out. They didn't believe I was doing what I was doing. That Anyhow, I won't mention the names of the people at CAMS in those days, but the reality was um, I spoke to John Rock and we had a meeting to determine how we would build these cars and anyhow, big problem we had. The uh, Commodore only had a 4.2 litre engine and we needed a 5 litre, so I dealt with um, the GMP and A division, parts and accessories, and they agreed to import 
the engines and the transmissions for the manual cars we wanted and um, bill them all to United Motors Parts account. So that's how it all started and um, from there the cars were ordered by United Motors to be built for a construction time that was going to take us at least 12 months. I took Peter around Australia uh, to speak to all the dealers that we could gather together and uh, asking them to put up $3,000 each to fund the Holden dealer team. Anyhow, only 57 dealers came involved and uh, much to my surprise, I thought at least 150 would have, but they didn't. And um, anyhow, uh, I decided on building these cars and um, we built the first one in the United Motors workshop. We stripped down the car, rebuilt it, and then put all the specs together. And uh, I sent it to Melbourne to Peter, and Peter then retuned the car. They took the engine uh, out and uh, sent the uh, heads. We increased the compression ratio and uh, a firm Mordialic redesigned the engines. We uh, did the front suspension. Um, I had all the catalogues. I'd been to the previous Frankfurt Motor Show in 79 and uh, I knew the parts that I wanted. So we had to, uh, for this car that I've got the photographs there of the launch, um, if I bought everything through the people I met at the Frankfurt Motor Show. I bought uh, the Amshaw wheels, uh, the Bellstein shock absorbers, the Momo steering wheels, and parts for the front suspension, which we redesigned. And we had all the skirt mouldings and the um, extrusions for the guards because we'd fitted bigger wheels, tyres, and that were all done by a firm in Melbourne and supplied to my company. So this became something that needed a manager and I asked John Harvey would he oversee it and manage it because it had nothing to do with the race team. And all of these cars were built starting with the VC Commodore and with luck we got a VC Commodore assembled as a race car on the guarantee we'd build these 500 cars and Peter I think raced it first at Simmons Plains in Tasmania in 1980. He won. He blitzed the field and it became a legendary car and um, with this Brock Commodore, we called it the Brock Commodore, and we numbered them all one to 500. And the fakes that have been sold in the market, I can assure you, I've got all the records. And every car was billed to United Motors. Then when we'd finished reassembling it in Melbourne and putting all the equipment in the car, it cost about 3000 $290 to re-equip these cars and we built them in three colours, white, red and black. We built, um, out of the 500, we built, um, originally it was going to be 140 manual and we increased it by 80 in the finish, but we had to work with Bob Bowden, the manager of GM P and A division, I met with him once a month, and we'd do a settle up. Uh, he'd give me all the invoices for what he'd brought in, and then United Motors, I'd write him a check, and on the 26th of every month, we paid for everything. And really, it was a very uh, amateurish way of looking at doing it, but it worked. And commercially was it successful? Commercially it was very successful. 
I mean, we use the profit out of converting the cars to race the whole. What we did though was we needed 500,000 to race two cars. And of course, <coughs> 57 dealers at 3,000 a car wasn't going to pay for it. So I went to Marlborough, John Evans at Marlborough, he was very good. First we got uh, 150,000 and I said, John, we need more money. And I said, what if I give you the naming rights and we call it the Marlborough Holden dealer team? He said, well, if you can do that. I said, but to do that, I want 250,000. And that's how we got the 250. And then he got his name and Peter raced a Marlborough Holden dealer car. So it all worked amateurishly, but we knocked on the door of people like uh, 3AW in Melbourne. We, we went to TAA. We went and literally tried every source of raising money. But the only way forward was to have the cars going out and being sold by dealers. And the car I stipulated had to have a minimum retail of 19990 And if anyone discounted it or advertised it, I would refuse to give them any further stock because I didn't, I was taking all the financial risk at United and somebody discounted the cars, I was in serious trouble because I was ordering these cars in good faith that these 57 dealers would take their allocation. And that went on for, oh, I don't know, a year or longer, and it worked. And uh, the place we operated out of in Melbourne, I had the, the dealer team up in Chetland Street at North Melbourne, and we had premises down uh, only two blocks away, but I brought in everything Build to United Motors, like Earnshaw Wills, they came out of Germany, but I ordered 500 sets. And then I went to Uni Royal, were still in business, they were down on South Road, they got taken over by Bridgestone, but they built, I gave them a car with Earnshaw Wills, and they built the tyre and got it homologated for Australian design rules because we had to do it. Now, this was sort of, how can I put it, um, an exercise in using people who would cooperate with us. And John Rock was right behind us as director of sales, so I had no trouble getting him to agree with things we wanted. Uh, we had Bob Bowden at Parts, and we had Frank Pound in the assembly plant. And we used to convert these engines, take them in on pallets, deliver them into the Dandenong plant, and they'd put them in the cars and put the engine number that was designated for the VIN number of the car. That's how it worked. Critical. Because the only spokesperson we've got is our industry body. They've become, now that Holden have left, <coughs> the spokesperson should be Paul Univic to be the spokesperson for the industry, not the RAA. And we've got to go on the front foot and we've got to say that we are a very important part of the economy. The problem in those days to borrow money was almost impossible. Now, I started out with no capital and I didn't want to put my house uh, and my family at risk. So I decided that what I would do was get all the knowledge before I started to borrow money. I didn't want to go into a business where somebody had to tell me what to do. I'm a very independent person and still am today. 
If I'd listened to advisors, I'd never have bought that side, and I certainly wouldn't have bought this because the day I bought this interest rates were 19.75, and Mr Keating gave us a recession we had to have. Now, my view was that if I had listened to people and took advice, they didn't know what I knew. Now, that's something that I'm not saying proudly, but when you talk to financial planners, accountants, um, lawyers, they're all specialists in their fields, but they haven't had the broad knowledge of looking at how our markets operate. And when you look at the market, you are taking huge risks because you're relying upon the people out there that we don't know who are yet to buy the products we've bought and ordered from a manufacturer four months ago and we're taking all the risk. This business is where the owner and the dealer principal has to be hands-on. He's got to come to work every day. He's got to make decisions that are instant. Look, we make decisions on trading cars for, you know, 100, 150,000. Now, you go and ask somebody working at Elders or Santos or somewhere, they've got to have a board meeting to approve that. <laughs> and yet here we are, we, we've got an appraisal pad, we go out, we look at this car and we decide, yep, we're going to do the deal. Now, that is what I call working principally from the knowledge that your gut feel is telling you you're on the right path. Now, if you haven't got that, then I don't know how you operate because you can't operate as an absentee owner. Please don't think I'm exaggerating this because it's the truth. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. No, I just thought it would be good to have a... a, a, a yeah. No, but what I want you to understand is that, that it's not, it's not yeah, textbook yeah. stuff. No, no, no. I, I you can't find a book here and turn to page 109 that tells you what to do. It doesn't exist. My policy would be if I had my time over again, I'd do it all the same. Mm -hmm.